Hello, I'm television meteorologist Mike Fairborn. It always makes me shudder when I'm part of a newscast that reports death or injury on our roads and highways. My heart goes out to everyone who's been involved in a serious accident or whose friend or family member has been involved in an accident. You're probably well aware that a common response to a serious accident is a request for a stop sign, yield sign, or a lower speed limit sign at the accident site. Intuitively, that seems like a reasonable response, and it is the right response for some intersections. But this research report from the Federal Highway Administration shows that trying to increase the amount of control at an intersection with signs usually doesn't bring about the desired results. In fact, the report shows that intersections with no control and those controlled by yield signs actually had lower accident frequencies than those controlled by stop signs. Determining the best type of traffic control for a given intersection or street is one of the most complex tasks faced by our public traffic and highway engineers. But through many decades of research and experience, engineers have developed reliable methods for controlling traffic on our streets and roads. I'd like to show you how they go about it. One thing engineers have learned is that they need to consider the entire system of streets and roads rather than just a single intersection. That's because traffic control in one location affects many nearby locations. The watchword has to be consistency from location to location. If similar intersections are controlled the same way as with the stop signs we see here, and stretches of road with similar characteristics have the same speed limits, then drivers can develop consistent habits. Drivers' expectations about the road ahead are based on their entire history of driving experience. Signs that don't really give specific instructions on how to drive, like this one, also lead to inconsistent behavior by drivers. Some will slow down, others won't. That, coupled with a false sense of security on the part of residents, is also a formula for disaster. Transportation engineers have been developing traffic control strategies and devices since the 1920s, and here's one of the tangible results of that research, the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. It's issued by the Federal Highway Administration and serves as a national standard. Like many states, Minnesota has its own version of the manual, tailored to our specific laws and needs, but reflecting the national recommendations. The standards in the Minnesota manual are applicable to all state and local roads, including those controlled by local governments. It's because engineers in every state use essentially the same guidelines that we encounter consistent traffic control strategies incorporating the same signs used the same way nationwide. While the manual helps to achieve consistency, it's important to realize that the manual can't possibly show how to deal with every real-life situation. In fact, that idea is stated in the book. This document is not a substitute for engineering judgment. It is the intent that provisions of this manual be standards for traffic control devices and installation, but not a legal requirement for installation. In each case, an engineer should base his or her traffic control recommendations on the results of a traffic study conducted at the location in question. And every study should consider at least four essential factors. One of these is vehicle speed. The speed that most drivers think is prudent is an important value to be considered. A second important factor is traffic volume. That is the number of cars that pass a given point during a given period of time. A third factor is how far drivers can see as they approach the intersection from each direction. Finally, engineers must take accident history into account. They get that information from maps like this showing accidents over an entire jurisdiction and from diagrams like this that show the locations and key facts for accidents that have occurred at a specific site. Everyone will benefit if the traffic control decisions are made consistently and on the basis of sound engineering research. So let's take a look at what the research says is likely to happen when specific traffic control decisions are made for this intersection. For example, let's say that in response to requests by neighbors, stop signs are installed at this intersection. The federal study I referred to earlier shows that at intersections of local streets with low traffic volumes and good sight lines like this one, only about one out of five drivers will actually come to a complete stop for a stop sign. So because we have installed stop signs, 80% of the drivers who pass through the intersection are now lawbreakers. And because drivers typically make mental notes to avoid situations where they feel that traffic control is unreasonable, traffic may be unnecessarily diverted and may cause congestion somewhere else. 
Improper use of stop signs breeds contempt for stop signs in general and for the public officials who installed the signs. Another way to look at the effect of the stop signs is to see that we have increased the range of drivers' responses. A few cars come to a full stop, most slow down to one degree or another, and some don't slow down at all. Since the range of responses has increased, we have made it more difficult to predict what any individual driver will do. So all things considered, it would probably have been better not to put up the stop sign. Stop signs should be reserved for those locations that really require a full stop. For example, intersections that have limited visibility, higher traffic volumes, or a history of many accidents. Now, let's look at a different kind of intersection, a rural intersection. We're likely to have an even lower volume of traffic here than we saw in our last example. And the cars are usually moving much faster than in town. Notice that there is limited visibility. Because of the high vehicle speeds, an accident here is likely to result in heavy damage and severe injuries. Now, let's say that in response to the wishes of neighbors, stop signs are installed in the hope of making the intersection safer. Unfortunately, we're likely to see the same results here that we saw in town. Only about 20% of the drivers will actually come to a full stop. Once again, we have a wider range of responses and less predictability. So let's try something else. Let's say that instead of stop signs, yield signs are installed. The federal research shows that at an intersection like this, the range of responses to a yield sign is likely to be about the same as to a stop sign. But now no one is breaking the law. More importantly, the yield signs tell drivers to make their own decisions about how to deal with the situation. And when the drivers on the busier road know that cross traffic is controlled by a yield sign, they'll be more likely to drive defensively and less likely to trust that the cross traffic will stop for them. So the yield sign may be the better choice in that example. But remember, an engineering study is always needed to determine the right course of action. Well, now we've seen that both in town and in the country, greater amounts of intersection control will not necessarily lead to greater safety. So what will lead to greater safety? Well, I want to arrive at a clear conclusion on that issue. But before doing so, I'd like to show you just one more example on a typical residential street. As in our previous examples, we have low traffic volume here. We can all understand why there might be an urgent request from neighbors to install a lower speed limit sign here. But once again, let's look at the likely outcomes if such a sign is installed. Whether we like it or not, research shows that setting a limit lower than the speed most drivers consider reasonable only leads to non-compliance by most drivers. So once again, we'll have a wider range of responses and less ability to predict the behavior of any given driver. At the same time, once the sign is in place, residents are likely to develop a false sense of security. This is undoubtedly not the outcome residents had in mind when they asked for the lower speed limit sign. So leaving the speed limit as it was is probably the right choice here. Now, if motorists usually drive at speeds they think are safe, no matter what's posted, you might reasonably ask why we have speed limits at all. Well, there are two good reasons. First, the safest situation is for all vehicles in traffic to be traveling at a uniform speed. Speed limit signs will help to achieve that goal as long as the posted limit is one that most drivers find reasonable. So, it's important to post consistent speed limits throughout the state. That's one reason why, in Minnesota, our regulatory speed limits, the ones shown in black and white signs, can only be established by the State Commissioner of Transportation. The other reason is that speed limit signs help police and highway patrol officers to enforce the speeding laws and curb unreasonable behavior. Well, now I'm ready to suggest some conclusions on this issue of traffic control. First, what may seem to be an obvious solution may be dangerously wrong. Increasing the apparent level of control by putting up signs will not necessarily make a situation safer. Second, officials need to take a system-wide view in making all traffic control decisions. Third, we need to rely on engineers to research each situation before any decisions are made. For a given situation, an engineer certainly might recommend traffic control signs, but the engineer also may suggest other kinds of solutions, such as turn lanes, additional street lighting, or changes in pedestrian crossing markings, just to name a few.
There are many ways to control traffic. The most important result of adopting these ideas is that we're likely to see greater compliance with traffic control devices because most drivers will see that the system is consistent and reasonable. But also, public agencies will find that they put themselves in the best legal position when they follow these guidelines. Officials should arrive at a systematic and system-wide traffic control policy based on advice from a qualified engineer and should then establish a track record of following that policy. The policy should state that decisions about specific locations will be based on research that takes traffic speeds, traffic volumes, site distances, and previous accident history into account. Well, if we have arrived at some sound conclusions about traffic control, it's important to realize that traffic control is just one part of the formula for safety on our streets and roads. Appropriate law enforcement by law officers and judges is also crucial. But by far, the most important part has to be played by individual drivers. If we all decide to take greater personal responsibility for safety, accident rates will decrease. Putting all these things together, that's what works. <laughs>